Welcome back to Rewind of the Living Dead. I'm Brother Martin. And I'm Mr. Reed. It's charming <laughs> to be back on the pod, Damon. <laughs> ah, the British accent comes out for an appearance. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, Patrick, tonight we are going to review one of, I think, one of the buzziest and most talked about horror films of the year. I think a lot of our horror creator friends have talked about this one. I think a lot of people in the horror communities have been talking about this one. Yes, indeed. Tonight we are talking about Heretic. Yes, Damon. Heretic released, of course, in November of 2024, starring Topher Grace as Elder Kennedy, Chloe East as Sister Paxton, so. Sophie Thatcher as Sister Barnes, and Hugh Grant as Mr. Reed, and as you mentioned, Damon, written and directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, Heretic is here, and yeah, it got super, super big buzz at Fantastic Fest this year as perhaps one of the best horror movies of the year. Damon, is it? So, this movie, I feel like is going to be... <sighs> I, I, I'm not trying to bury the lead here. I really enjoyed it, but here's where I'm going to say I think this is going to this is going to feel so different for everyone that watches this movie. I feel like this is going to be one of the most polarizing horror films of the year because I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna predict in our non spoiler section, which is where we're at right now, there are going to be people who are going to listen to this review and go watch the movie and say, "You're right. I absolutely loved it. What a thoughtful, intelligent, creative horror film." I think there are people going to say this really isn't a horror film. It's more of kind of like a psychological thriller and you know, it's got horror esque moments, but it's not really horror. And then there's going to be a group of people who say I absolutely hated it because of the <laughs> themes behind the movie. And the reason I say that Patrick is at the heart of it all. And it, I mean, you can tell this by the trailers. This is a film that is questioning religion and we always talk about like subjects you don't bring up at Thanksgiving with your family. Usually it's, oh, it's coming in religion because those are the two things that usually end with like your one uncle sleeping in his car and one of the cousins getting a drum leg upside his head or a pumpkin <laughs> pie on his face because you just don't talk about those things around like large groups of people because it always ends up going badly. And that's kind of where I feel like heretic fits in. And I'm one of those people. I mean, my wife absolutely dreads me being around large swaths of family because I will get into it. I just am. I'm one of those kind of people. I don't really back down. I know you're like that, too. Like, we're kind of cut from that similar cloth where it's like, no, let's talk about it. And and you can see our significant others going, oh, please, just please shut up for like fucking three hours while we spend time with our uncle from Cincinnati. No, we're going to talk about religion tonight. Right. And that's exactly what heretic is. It's uh, it's an interesting um, interesting thing what they did with this movie because you, you you talk about it not necessarily being a horror film. I think it is very much a psychological thriller, which you and I agree does fall under the purview of horror in, in our opinions. And this has horrific elements and it has the key element, Damon, it has dread all over it. But weirdly enough, like if you watch the trailer, I'm going to tell you right now, this is a movie that's like, it's all it is almost an abigail situation what you see in the trailer is what you get obviously there's some very clear spoiler stuff that you don't get into but the the movie you see in that trailer two young mormons trying to ply their religion uh door to door but they bump into this guy and he decides to challenge their religion by truly testing them in some terrifying way trapping them in this house and challenging their faith that is the movie like i've told you the whole movie except for the spoiler part which is it, it to me we could talk about most of this movie without even spoiling the spoiler part because damon this this is becoming a dreaded phrase around here i started clocking this movie and you know what happens when patrick starts clocking it means that i'm like when when is it going to happen when is the thing happening and really, the thing doesn't happen for, I want to say, I mean, I, I did clock it at an hour, and then it was like a false, I thought it was a moment that was going to reveal everything, and then it just kept going without revealing the thing, because really, the reveal is the end of the movie. That's, that's the conceit of this movie. Some people are going to hate it on that alone. I've seen some people already who said they hated this movie and it was trash. I've seen other people who said it is instantly the best movie of the year. You know why I like that? Because it gives people feelings. It makes them engage. Either if they hated it, 
that means that they were in on, on some level they were in or they didn't escape i mean they they stuck around long enough to hate it uh, you know they didn't walk out of the theater but i and that's another thing with this movie i think you would agree with me this is a theater experience because you will miss oh i don't know 90 percent of what's important if you're at home and you can pick up your phone and you can answer uh answer your girlfriend or you can walk the dog or the dog comes up and starts licking your face you're going to miss so much of the movie because it really is in the details. It really is in the talking. It's one of those movies you have to lock in on. Sometimes as audience members, we're looking for an escape. We're looking for just kind of a ride. I would call that like a terrifier three where you're just like, I'm just going to sit back and let this thing take me for a ride. Heretic is a, it's a, it's a finals exam. (laughs) Like it is going to make you think. I like that. I prefer that challenge. I prefer being able to sit there and really think about something. Now, ultimately, yes, this movie makes me think about a ton of things. Did it like truly satisfy me in the end? I think that, I don't want to say it's up for debate because it makes it sound like I didn't like this movie. I did like this movie, but I guess I was kind of looking for something more. And I'll give you an example. You, this is a film you like. You like the movie Deus Ex Machina, the uh, Alex Garland film. You're yeah. a big fan of that movie. Yeah. I was a big fan of that movie until the end. In the end, it just turned into any old AI Terminator, like like robots will kill you type movie. And I was like, what well, fuck? Like, it, this was such an interesting, challenging, like like complex movie until it wasn't. That's kind of how I feel. I I like Heretic better than Deus Ex Machina. I'm telling you that right now. This ending is not that level of disappointment for me. But I was sort of like, hmm, I really thought this was going to go down some deeper hole. And instead, it kind of gave me the Hollywood ending. So I'll I'll agree and I'll disagree in, in, in a certain sense. The reason I agree about the way this film is set up is this is a film that challenges you and not just like, again, this is a a film that challenges your faith. If you are a religious person, this is a movie that's going to challenge your faith. Now there's going to be a big swath of the audience. Who's going to say, I don't go to the movies to see that I go to be entertained for a couple hours and kind of escape my everyday life. I don't want to think about, politics and religion and all that i want to just go in and kind of enjoy a movie and veg out and you know what you're not wrong everyone's got their own you know yeah. what they go to the movies for and that's totally fine um so i'm not going to say you're wrong in that and then other people are going to say when it challenges your faith they're going to get angry because it challenges their faith that's the difference between facts and faith when it's facts you can't really dispute that. I can't tell you two plus two and you say four. And if I say two plus two and you say five, well, I can prove to you two plus two is four. But when you talk about faith, that's a whole other animal because you're asking someone to change their belief structure. And belief is something totally different than facts, than knowledge, because faith is just what you believe. doesn't matter that it's true or not. It's what you believe. And when you challenge that, People get rather angry. If you've never yeah. had a del- if you never had a religious conversation with somebody, have that conversation, and you realize how quickly and defensive they'll get about that. Because when you challenge someone's faith, you're not challenging what they know; you're challenging what they believe. And when you challenge what someone believes, that's really a losing argument because you can't real. I mean, can you hopefully have an intelligent conversation and maybe you know change their mind if you're if you're dealing with that kind of person? Sure, but. Not usually because faith is different than fact. So I think there's going to be that side of people. The reason why I really enjoyed this film is because it does challenge you. It's a very intelligent film. Now, as you said, the film gets into like an hour and you think you kind of know where it's going. And then you said you don't really figure out exactly where it's going to the end. The reason I loved that is because I had an idea what was going on the entire time. And I, I mean, I, I, when I say an idea, I, I I knew the premise of the film, which is, as I said, it's not, no spoiler here, it's it's challenging faith. I mean, you're dealing with two young Mormon missionaries, and if you've never met young Mormon missionaries, and I have, actually went to college with a Mormon missionary, um, that is, that you know, that's a, generally speaking, that's an 18, 19, 20-year-old person who has grown up in the church, grown up of that faith, 
and they've never really left they've never really left that doctrine their entire lives and then they kind of get sent out into the world and it's almost like a you know a splash of cold water in your face because what you what you realize is the world is a lot bigger a lot different than what you imagined it would be but part of that is also to challenge your faith is to challenge your your piousness to try you know to 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 challenge your beliefs and you go out into the world and you come back and and the whole point of it is to convert people to your religion that's what mormon missionaries do so these are of the most pious people you will meet. You know, this is not your cousin who goes to church on Christmas Day and never goes again for the rest of the year. <laughs> you know, this is these are these are mission, Mormon missionaries are people who are very serious about their religion, and so this is a film that challenges that, and it's an uncomfortable conversation. It is, and I loved it because you just don't get those kind of uncomfortable conversations in film. I remember. We just had an anniversary. I want to say it was like seven years ago or eight years ago. I saw it on, on uh, Instagram the other day. It was the anniversary of a movie that came out a few years ago called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. You remember that movie? It won a bunch Fantastic of Oscars. Fantastic movie. And there's a really poignant scene in that film where a priest comes to visit uh, Frances McDormand's character. And he's trying to talk her out of these billboards she put up where she's basically bashing the local police chief for not solving her daughter's murder. And this stirs up all sorts of controversy in this small little town in Missouri. And so the the priest comes to visit her and he's like, you know, hey, you know, we really like you to take these signs down. It's making everyone really uncomfortable and, you know, whatever. And then she turns it on him. And you know what scene I'm talking about, where she talks to him about child abuse in the catholic church and she really turns it on him hardcore and like by the end of it it's really like and she's like so you know she's like because you never really answered that question like if you're against this or not so you know maybe not maybe you should not chastise me about my choices when you know you got this going on and you guys never really solved that problem in the catholic church and the look on his face he's dumbfounded he's like, holy shit i can't believe this lady just said this to me <laughs> That scene cracks me up because it's so wildly uncomfortable in that moment of her pressing a priest on the horrific acts that have been carried out inside the Catholic Church that no one really likes to talk about. We all kind of hush-hush about it. That's kind of what this movie is. This movie is making you question things that you don't want to question if you're a faithful person or if you're a super religious person. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong for having belief i'm not saying you're wrong for having faith i'm just saying that's what this film does and so it's gonna make a lot of people say i don't want to question that i don't want to be preached to in a movie just the same way the same way that there are faith-based movies that come out that are poignantly trying to tell you that god is awesome I don't want to sit there and see those either. Like I understand that. Like I've, I've, when I, 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 I've seen those kind of like backdoor films where it's like, oh, I know what they're doing here. Like you're trying to indoctrinate me. You're trying to tell me that like Jesus is the way. I understand not wanting to see that because I don't want to see that. So I understand the flip side of people who say I don't really want to go see this and have someone talk talk to me about my religion or 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 or, or try to talk me out of my faith. It's a really difficult conversation, and that's what this film does. But what I think uh, Beck and Woods do very wisely here, for all those people who are like, well, yeah, you know, and I know we have religious people among us that listen to this show because they've reached out before and stuff like that. So we know they exist. We know they're out there, and we thank you for tuning in. Beck and Woods are not uh, just uh, regular old writers. They're veteran writers. They've been writing forever. They really have. And while it is a challenging movie they very wisely make the antagonist the questioner of faith the one the one who comes to these the one who locks these two young girls up in his house and won't let them leave he's the bad guy and he's the one questioning faith so even if you are one of those people out there who's like i don't come to these movies to get you know my faith questioned i'm not interested guess what don't worry because the, the guy who's questioning faith, he's the bad guy. N no spoilers here. You're not rooting for him. You're really not. You want to see what he's got up his sleeve. That's what's going to keep you on the hook. And that's what does keep us on the hook in this movie. He's, he's like, I've, I've figured something out. And I want to see if you guys can figure it out too. And they, they very wisely and very, I, I would say, like 
minimum it's a very minimalist approach in this movie it's almost like you know it's a it's a contained horror basically it takes place in one one house for the most part they just go we're gonna keep you on that line because he's claiming he's got something up his sleeve we're gonna keep you on that line throughout this entire movie and see where it goes now i'm not going to give you a spoiler as to where it goes we're about to get into that right now anyway but beck and woods being veteran writers and being people who, excuse me, make a lot of uh, money at, at keeping audiences in the seats, wisely said, well, what if we just make that guy the bad guy? Then everybody wants to sit down. Because then all the people like you and me who are not religious, they go, all right, asshole, let's see what you got. Why are you locking these two girls up? What do you got? And then the people of faith can go, all right, asshole, you lock these two girls up and you're saying you got something. Let's see what you got. Now the whole audience is on the same side, regardless of how they feel about religion. Very smart thing to do because Beck and Woods are smart guys. I actually met Brian Woods and we had a like wonderful long conversation at Austin Film Fest one year. He's a very, very nice guy, very approachable guy, very smart guy. And you could just tell that he's an incredibly thoughtful person and it shows in this script because i th and i think that the 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 shallower of the audience won't see that that they have wisely put the entire audience despite their belief system in the same position right and that's another mark of good directors too because they also directed this as they go how do we position this audience who is going to have many different ideas about faith or not faith denominations, backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How are we going to do all that and sit them all on the same side of the table? They managed to do it in this movie. If you're rooting for uh, uh, Mr. Reed in this movie, you're probably, you're probably the wrong per like person. No, I don't think anyone's rooting for him in this movie, but they, they I, I just, it's so smart. It's a very smart movie. It's an incredibly smart movie. And I get it. Sometimes you don't want a smart movie. Like, I, I am absolutely fried. I've been going nonstop since the last time we recorded a podcast. I really have not stopped. And my brain is sometimes done. Like, I want to sit down and watch a good French extremity movie. But if I got to read subtitles, my head's already fucking ringing. Like, I'm like, I can't even do that right now. I need to sit down and watch something that just lets me go. Heretic is not a movie that lets you go. Heretic is a movie that demands you sit in that seat, you listen, and you look, and you pay attention to every single detail because it's going to matter but Damon, I can hold my tongue no longer. I mean, I feel like we should we should roll into spoilers, right? Well, let me we'll get to spoilers in, in two seconds. Let me just throw this out there. And and when I talk about you know questioning faith and 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 how this movie is going to make you answer uncomfortable questions, the reason I say I loved it so much is because what what Woods and and, and Beck do is they attack it in a very intelligent way to where they're not talking down to you. This isn't a movie that's that's you know we and I'm not let's just take religion out of it. Let's just make it about any subject and and you can watch a movie where you're learning about let's say a military installation and you're learning. Now I'm not a military guy. I have a lot of family in the military, but I've never been in the military. When you watch a movie that's got like deeply intrinsical you know uh, jargon about the military. We've watched enough military movies to like, okay, I kind of see where they're going with this. I understand when they say this and that, you know, the, the, the terminology, the wording, and it can get kind of deep in the woods a little bit when you watch a really, really, real, like, you know, really thought out, well drawn out, you know, uh, film about, uh, about the military. And if you have no military background, there are going to be moments where you might feel a little lost, but proper intelligent writing can draw you back in because they explain it in such a way that it makes sense, right? Like that's a that could be a highly technical conversation. Or 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 watching like I just watched rewatch recently a, an incredible movie by Aaron Sorkin, The Social Network. Now, I I I love that movie, but I couldn't code you shit. I couldn't code anything. I'm not a coder. But they tell the story in such a way that it's like, yes, you know what they're doing is is really detailed as far as like building websites and what they did to build Facebook. But you don't get lost in that. They're not trying to teach you HTML. So it's like you got to do it in a way that you can explain it to the audience without losing the audience. And I think that's what Heretic does. It challenges you and it makes you ask hard, makes you answer hard questions 
But it does it in such a way that you're not, it doesn't talk down to you. It's not making you feel stupid about it. Now, as I said, there's going to be those two groups of people. One who are going to say, don't question my faith, asshole. And I understand that's a, I understand that's going to be that group of people. I'm not even saying you're wrong. I'm just saying like, I know there's going to be, and there's going to be other people who say, I just don't go to a movie to see that. I don't go to a movie to be talked to about these kind of subjects. I just want to enjoy and veg out. Like you just said, you don't right now. You're probably not in the mood to watch Heretic. You're probably in the mood to sit down and watch, you know, The Hangover or something. You know, just something that's kind of like mindless, you know, mindless entertainment. That's fine. Um, but that's why I would say, like, if you go into this movie and you haven't seen it yet, understand it's going to talk to you about difficult subjects, but it's going to talk to you in a way that's intelligent and 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 approach it in a way that is understandable and relatable. Doesn't mean you're going to love it. I'm not telling you you're going to love it because of that, but I'm just saying like they, the, the way this film is written is really impressive and they do it in such a way that when I walked out of the theater, I was like, that was one of the smartest films I've seen in a really long time. Cause it's just so different. Um, before we get to spoilers, do we want to do best performance and MVP like we normally do? I actually would petition that let's do it inside spoilers. So we can, I can talk about certain things that I think, pertain to the spoilery side of the movie all right well with that being said folks if you haven't seen heretic it is in theaters right now um i think you can tell by patrick and i we both enjoy it i would say i loved it you liked it so both you know pretty positive reviews so go check it out it's in theaters right now very small film very small cast but a very very well-made film it is A24, and they don't typically make, you know, a lot of bad films. I'll say they never make bad films, but they do make pretty good films. Um, so, with that being said, we are now going to get into our spoiler section. So, again, if you haven't seen Heretic before, Warren, we are now going to get into spoilers. Do you want to do you want to kick things off with the, the plot, or do you want to get into a uh, best performance? Which one do you, you want to kick it off? Um, We could do, let's do the plot. Why not? All right. So. Basically, as you said, this isn't a spoiler because what you see in the trailer is very much what you get in this film. Two young missionaries, Sister Barnes and Sister Paxton, are touring around Colorado on their Mormon missionary and going house to house, person to person, trying to convert people to Mormonism, the Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. And they have an appointment to go meet with a guy at his house named Mr. Reed. When they knock on the door, it takes an impossibly long time for him to get to the door. But when he finally does, you see Hugh Grant in his little old man glasses, his his sweater. He looks very much like Mr. Rogers, like 100% Mr. Rogers. And what you see in the trailer is exactly what happens in the film. They're like, you know, hey, would you like, you know, you had the curious questions about, uh, you know, Mormonism. And he's like, sure, come on in. She's like, well, we can't come in unless there's a woman in the house. And he's like, well, my wife's in here. Does that count? And they're like, yeah, they're like, come on in, we're making pie. And so they sit down and they start talking, and it's a pretty, you know, timid conversation. And they start, you know, little by little getting into conversations about religion. And suddenly at one point he busts out, he has a Book of Mormon. And he has a giant list of, like, little notes and everything in there, and they're super impressed. And he clearly knows the history. But then Mr. Reed starts rattling off some facts some troubling facts let's say about the mormon church and, and the creation of the mormon church and these kids and these girls are kind of like um yeah i don't know that this is where we were kind of going with this conversation necessarily mr reed and you know he just keeps going keeps going and then he walks away and eventually he, he kind of lures them into his like den i guess like a office. study yeah and he, he more or less starts kind of teaching them or, or, or kind of preaching to them about the history of religion in general. And these are all really kind of tough questions these girls don't want to answer. And at the end, he says, well, I'm not going to stop you from leaving, but if you want to leave, you got to leave out the back of my house. The front door's locked. They discover that. They realize they're kind of trapped in there. And he says, if you want to leave, you're going to have to leave through the back of my house. So you got to go through one of these two doors. And that's where you see in the trailer, he writes the word belief on one door and disbelief on the other. And he says, you have to choose which door you want to go into. And that's where things kind of take a weird twist in this movie where they're kind of like, um, why are we choosing and where does this go? And that's when things kind of go haywire. The the setup of this movie, and it's a long setup. I would call this movie a slow burn for sure. Um, it reminded me of movies like Barbarian, um, Speak No Evil, uh, movies where you're like, hey, buddy, do you see all the red flags? 
Like, do you see, do you see the problems here? And they don't. But what's what I think Beck and Woods did very wisely with these two characters, uh, Sister Paxson and Sister Barnes, is that he they build he they very subtly build these two characters up for what their knowledge base is in the world. And uh, Sister Barnes, played by Sophie Sophie Thatcher, is a little more street savvy, and you very effortlessly learn that her life was a little tougher. She didn't start out in the church. Um, you know, single mom, troubled, you know, d dad died uh, uh, of disease and all this stuff. So she's she's got a lot more experience and she's picking up on the red flags. Chloe East's character, Sister Paxton, is not picking up on the red flags, but they're very wisely just showing you things. I love when when directors are confident enough to just show you images, show you an actor looking a certain way, show you an actor notice a certain something and another actor not notice something. They're telling you so much of the story without ever telling you, without ever just, just spitting it at you. And for a talky movie, that's impressive. It's impressive to to care, to to develop these characters without having to do a lot of talking. You understand that you're dealing with two very different skill sets. One is very theologically, you know, sound because uh, Sister Paxton is incredibly pious and she really believes in that book. Sister Barnes, street savvy, sees red flags, sees a problem with this guy. But he, despite all of that, they still get lured closer and closer and closer into this weird web that Mr. Reed has designed. And Damon, he... Po po uh, poses something to them, you know, and this is all after trailer stuff because after trailer is basically the spoiler por portion of the movie, but he basically says, I have figured out the one true religion and you're not going to like what it is. Wonderful hook. When I heard that at about the one hour mark, I went, cool. What, what are we going to find out here? What is, what is the Shyamalanian twist going to be? What will it be, Damon? What possibly could he have discovered? And really what it turns into is a series of challenges and tests in, in, and not like in a Saw way, although some people might compare it to Saw in some weird way. He's trying to test their faith and he's trying to test how easy it is for them to believe in something because he clearly does not believe in faith. He clearly has a problem with faith, and he wants to show them his problem with faith by testing their faith through these series of challenges, through these philosophical questions. And it, it all comes to a huge head, Damon, and um, I don't know, do we, do we tell or do we, or do we get into categories and let it boil from there? Well, I think we can I think we can at least talk about like the conclusion in terms of like where this is going, because everything that Mr. Reed is doing during this entire movie, Hugh Grant's character, Mr. Reed, everything he's doing in this movie is, again, what you said. He's getting them to question their faith and challenging how deep their beliefs really run. And he keeps he keeps upping the ante. Now, what I loved about the way this unravels is this isn't like hostile, where he's yeah. like tying them to chairs and, and you know trying to pull out their fingernails or anything, trying to teach them what you know what he wants to teach them. He's actually like challenging them in a very intelligent way and 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 really he doesn't try to hurt them or anything like that like it's, it's again it's all mental based like very you know uh you know structured that way and then you know really what this boils down to is mr reed is basically saying the one true religion is control that's the whole thesis of this movie the one true religion is control every religion is out to control you and that's what he's trying to teach these girls. And do they learn the lesson, Patrick? <laughs> oh, do they? I don't really know. And that I think that's the grand debate. I think that maybe is ultimately where, at least what I took away from the movie, was that they they did use their faith to get out of the situation. Not uncommon in horror movies. To go, your faith is going to be tested. And in the end, your faith will get you out of it. Like that's that's ultimately what it is. And I would even credit this movie, even despite the fact that, yes, uh, the, 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 the two sisters are indeed religious. I would argue that it's not even really like a pro-religious answer, but it is a pro-faith answer. It is saying like your faith will get you out of the thing. That that's to me, that seemed to be Beck and Woods thesis 
did you see it that way did you find did you find it to be a pro-faith answer i thought it was actually what i the way i took it was is i found it to be more up to the audience to decide was it a pro-faith answer because me personally as a non-religious person when it was over i was kind of thinking to myself well in a way i think mr reed kind of proved his point because everything he was saying about religion trying to control your thoughts and kind of control the way you're believing things and the way you're doing things um in a way he kind of proved his point in a horrific way in the way he's like kidnapping two young girls and trapping them in his house and forcing them through this you know maze of of awful things happening to them um and as i said not like torture it's not like that you know but um in that way i would say like when it was over i was kind of like well yeah like i think he kind of proved a point but at the end of the day did sister paxson and sister barnes necessarily question their faith that's the question i don't know that they did i think at the end maybe their their faith was strengthened so yeah like i i, I don't i don't know that i would say it's pro-faith or pro-not faith i think it's i think that's the difficult question this movie forces you to answer is did he or not did he actually force them to question their faith did they actually question their faith i mean he proved that control works because I, and he did so much of it, uh, like as you said, he's not torturing these women. He's basically just putting them in scenarios and making them make the choice. But he is controlling the outcome regardless. And that was his like ultimate thesis for religion. He's like, he's like the people that got you into religion. They they're just they're they're doing it to control you. And they no matter the answer you give them, it will always be they are the right answer. They have the answer. They have everything figured out and you are under their control. That's how it goes. So do these characters break that control in the end? They do. They absolutely break his control. But he proved that you can do it. It's not, and then and then that begs another philosophical question is, can you have faith but not be controlled? Right. So, you know, it, this is for the, the art goons among us who really want to question those kind of things. And that's what Beck and Woods, I think, presented in this in this uh, I would call it a thesis. I think their movie is a thesis. It's just like, can your faith and and, you know, the 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 ultimate control that religion tends to wish to put upon you, can those be two separate things? They seem to answer that the answer is yes that you can you can indeed have faith and still not be controlled by the right and wrong of a specific dogma but may and maybe damon because it's so ambiguous that i i felt i don't want to say dissatisfied is like the wrong word but i just sort of felt like it was maybe unresolved a little bit you know i think that's just another way to say dissatisfied but really it felt a little unresolved for me in the end because i was like well you know both both parties came in, in insisting there was an answer one party comes out dead <laughs> which is mr reed he's he's he doesn't make it out of his own experiment but do but but what I don't feel like Sister Paxton learns or does she learn anything? I don't know. I don't know, Damon. I guess that's my that's my problem with this movie. My big problem with this movie is like I don't know if it definitively tries to take a stance in the end, and maybe the even handed of even handedness of all of that didn't quite sit well with me. And the reason why it worked for me in that regard, because you're right, it doesn't necessarily answer the question, but think of it this way. This is the way I would correlate it. Um, when you watch a documentary, let's say a true crime documentary, a documentary about a crime, I would say 95 times out of 100, the documentary is trying to sway you one way or the other. You know, they're trying to say this guy's guilty or not guilty, or this girl's guilty or not guilty, right? Like, that's the majority of, of documentaries. They're trying to sway your opinion on, you know, this is this happened, but this guy was innocent, or this happened, and this guy was guilty. That's just how it goes. Think of this as a documentary where they're not going to give you the answer, where they're not going to tell you, hey, this guy's the murderer, he's not the murderer. They're going to make you decide. And I think that's kind of that. I think that to me is why it spoke so high, why it spoke so highly this film, because it doesn't give you the answer. It doesn't just tell you, hey, here's two plus two. What's the answer? It's four. 
it's telling you like, hey, faith is faith is what it is. It's it's faith. It's belief. At the end of this movie, you may come out of this movie thinking, you know what? My faith is strengthened. I believe more than ever that God had a hand and 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 he saved this girl and he conquered the bad guy and my faith is strengthened in all this. And you could say Sister Paxton walks out of the house thinking when she finally escapes that yeah, her faith paid off. She had faith in God. She made it through a harrowing situation. She came on the other side. But then you can take the other side of the coin and say that everything that Mr. Reed told her was absolutely true. It was all control. Nothing was there. There was no supernatural at work. Nothing supernatural was at work. It was all corporal of this world. And yet she still found a way to survive it of her own accord, of her own choosing, not because there was some pie, there was some mystic hand on her controlling the situation. On that side, you come out saying, well, yeah, like she's going to question her faith now because everything she was taught in that house and everything she went through in that house would make her question her belief structure. But I think that's what's what I enjoyed about this movie so much is because it doesn't just give you the answer. It doesn't just tell you you're right or wrong. And I know you as the art house goon, Jordan, you know, normally when like, you know, like we watch the end of a movie and it doesn't give me the answer, I'm the one who's like, what the fuck? Like, what, what does that mean? What is that? What is that about? Like, we talk about the ending of men. I'm like, what? What? What, what is that? What happened? What's going on here? This one's a little more straightforward. And I think that's kind of the point. They're basically saying at the end of this movie, did she come out on the other side of this still feeling her faith and, and, and believing in God? Or did she come on the other side of this kind of believing what Mr. Reed told her was true? And I think they're leaving it ambiguous on purpose because they want you to answer that for yourself. And I know that may not be satisfying and that's okay. It's not satisfying for me. It was totally satisfying because I came out with a conclusion of my own, but I'm okay that you, cause in this, because you are dealing with such a difficult conversation, such a difficult question of faith, the fact that they don't just give you the answer. Like, at, at, like I almost feel like people would be angrier if they came at the end of the movie and said, look, God is real. Oh, yeah. We proved that would be it. bad. And then the other side, God's not real. We proved God's not real. I think that would piss off just as many people. Not answering the question, making you answer it for yourself, is kind of the point of faith. It's kind of the point of religion. And, uh, you know, the truth is, is that neither side can can definitively answer the question, right? Now, you and I are guys that don't have any faith. So we're, we're not saying uh, religion doesn't exist. We're saying we've seen no proof of it. That's all, that's all you and I are saying. If somebody floats down from the heavens and goes, I am your Lord and Savior, watch me do this thing. And I'm like, okay, well, I did see that. There's the proof. That's what you and I are looking for. But ultimately, we don't see it. And, and people of faith say, I don't need to see it. I, I know it. I can feel it in my heart. So Beck and Woods very wisely go, well, we can't answer your question then, can we, right? If we have the answer, who are we, right? <laughs> We're not all, Beck and Woods are not the all-seeing eye. They can't, they can't give you the answer. So they wisely don't answer it for you. I don't know if the journey leading up to it was so enthralling that I was like, cool, okay, I understand. I understand where you're at at the end here. Um, it was still a good movie. It was still well acted, well shot. I mean, you know, great writing, great philosophical questions that, again, aren't talking down to anybody. I think everything in this movie is accessible. So that's why I'm saying, like, I don't actually dislike this movie. I just thought it was okay because maybe the journey leading up to that answer, which for all intents and purposes is the correct answer, which is we don't know. The journey leading up to it was not amazing, you know, and, and maybe that's a high bar, but it's been a big, long year for a lot of horror movies. So I'm looking for something that really stands out in that respect. And I didn't quite get it with uh, with with Her with Heretic, but I still liked it. I still I still thought this was a good movie. I still think people should definitely see this movie. And uh, yes, Damon, guess what? I definitely think they should see it in the theater because I think you need to lock in. That's the best way to watch this kind of movie. Yeah, and for me personally, I loved it because it was unlike anything I've really seen before because I've seen – you know, versions of this movie, done, not not necessarily this movie about questioning faith, but just this movie of, like, um, attacking a person's belief or attacking a person's, yeah. um, you know, thought structure, whatever it may be, and done in a way that just turns into torture or and turns into a way of, like, you know, you're just doing it to convince them they're wrong. 
And this doesn't necessarily do that. Like I said, the ambiguous ending of like, was it faith or was it not? Do you believe in faith or do you not believe in faith? Did she walk away with a stronger faith in God or did she walk away not even believing in God? The fact that you can have that question and not really know the answer, I kind of enjoyed that. I kind of enjoyed the ambiguity of it. Um, so for me, I loved it. And I also, again, loved the intelligent way this film was written, the way that Mr. Reed was not this physically imposing, evil, you know, just, you know, monstrous guy. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I think he's kind of, evil and monstrous, though. No, he's he evil. is, but he's, <laughs> yeah. he is, but he's like, he's kind of like this mousy British dude. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's yeah. not like... Oh you know, no, they're they're, they're yeah, they're very good at subverting the expectations of all three characters, which is yeah, a like testament to great writing. Like this is why you don't cast Dave Batista in the role of Mr. Reed. Like that would be a totally different character <laughs> when you got this six foot three hawking guy like standing over them because they're I mean, they're still afraid because they're two young twenty year old girls dealing with a guy who is ultimately still gonna be able to overpower them, even though he's not like this, you know physically imposing guy he's kind of a mousy british dude but still they know that like he's got them trapped in their house they can't get out without him letting them out they've already tried so it's again it's more of a psychological torture than it is a physical thing and i appreciated that because there's so many of these movies that just slides down that 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 physical torture and and it can be done right i mean it can be done right but this one being more of a psychological torture was kind of a nice refreshing twist by the way, sign me up for the Dave Bautista sequel. I 100% in for that. Spoiler for the, for the sequel section. <laughs> yeah. So now, Patrick, with that being said, let's get into our categories. We're going to kick things off as we do each and every week here with our first category. <laughs> with our best performance, which is interesting when you play that clip before Heretic, which is a very religious movie. Um, Patrick, best performance. Who do you got for Heretic? <laughs> I just want to say I get more and more uncomfortable because every time we do welcome to primetime bitch, I'm about to say a woman's name and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not calling you anything. It's just what it's Freddie says that we are, we're not saying that um, because my, my best performance uh, goes to Chloe East as sister Paxton. Chloe East is, a, uh, or sister Paxton, excuse me, is established very much as the naive, as the mousy, as the, as the girl, the the little, basically a little church mouse is what she is. She she knows very little about sex. She knows very little about how the outside world works. Her whole life is Mormonism. Her whole life, and so when she comes face to face with this very savvy uh, British man from some from faraway places who has very challenging questions you feel like she's outmatched you really do you go oh boy like she's she's very naive she's a very naive very mousy girl very unexperienced in the world this is probably not going to go well for her well damon there is one other thing about this movie that we haven't talked about yet and that is and this takes a lot of skill and this is why i respect uh beck and woods for doing this um they would lead you to believe that sister barnes the street savvy girl who went through a couple of dads and has had a lot of problems and can see all the red flags you would assume she's our final girl damon she is not she actually gets taken out at about i would say the top of the third act and you realize that this is a false protagonist. Sister Barnes is made to believe, you, we are made to believe that her savvy and her street smarts and her ability to question things is what's gonna get them out of this situation because we've seen that time and time again in every single movie. Beck and Wood said no. The mousy church girl played by Chloe East who you don't believe could get out of this situation. She is, she is ripe for the picking. She is the perfect bait she gets out of the situation. I mean, she there's still a deus ex machina in there, which kind of drives me nuts. But otherwise, she truly is the final girl of this film. But they take the entire film to get to that conclusion. Very tough thing to do. And Chloe East, as a performer, as an actor, sold it so well, I had to give it to her. So I wasn't really familiar with Chloe East before this movie. I looked her up, and she's been a very experienced actor. She's done plenty of stuff, but I just hadn't really known her. Um, 
and I'm very familiar with with uh, Hugh Grant. I'm very familiar with Sophie Thatcher. We've talked about Sophie Thatcher on this show before, uh, doing The Boogeyman, which is another Beck and Woods film, and other movies. Yeah, you know, other movies she's done, Yellow Jackets, her TV show she does. I am a big, big Sophie Thatcher fan. I was not familiar with Chloe East, so I had really no knowledge working of her going into this, any expectations. Um, but I was really blown away by her performance, her ability to shift from that kind of mousy timid pious religious girl and basically become fighting for her own life but doing it in a way that is believable you know like she doesn't shift into you know she just doesn't shift into like total badass mode where she's like mowing down bad guys or anything you're like whoa where'd this come from she does it in an intelligent way in a thoughtful way because she may not have street smarts but she is a smart girl she is an intelligent girl and I think the way they portrayed that, the way that Chloe East portrayed that was very, very good. So I really did enjoy her performance. I thought she did a great job. Yeah, 100%. So for me, no shocker here. I think the best performance is the one that everyone's going to be talking about coming out of this film because it takes a lot to do what was done in this film, and that is Hugh Grant. Um, I When I say I was familiar with Hugh Grant's career, I am, but I'm not. And what I mean by that is, is I know who Hugh Grant is. I've, I've seen, you know, I know exactly who he is. But have I seen a lot of Hugh Grant's films? Not really. Um, the one Hugh Grant film I am super familiar with is Love Actually. I do like that movie, the Christmas movie. Oh. Um, but, you know, everything else he's done has been kind of like romantic comedies. And I'm just, I think I've mentioned on the show before, we did Your Monster. I'm not a big romantic comedy guy. So I'm not a big Hugh Grant guy. I know, he, I know who he is. I know he's talented. I know he's won awards. And he's a very beloved actor. But I'm not like a Hugh Grant guy. I don't sit around and watch Hugh Grant movies all day. But I do know the kind of movies that Hugh Grant typically plays. And this movie is definitely out of his wheelhouse. Playing a bad guy, playing a villain, playing a very menacing, intelligent villain is different. This is, um, this is in a way, like Lex Luthor. Like Lex Luthor and Superman, he's never going to overpower Superman. He's never going to out-muscle Superman. He's got to outthink Superman. He's got to be smarter than Superman. And so that's what Lex Luthor is. And so that's kind of what Mr. Reed is. Like Mr. Reed is outthinking these girls. He's, he's questioning their faith and doing it in a way where they're like scared, but also he's preaching to them. As a non-religious guy, he's preaching to them. And and the way he does it in such a way that it's so smart. And when I say menacing, it's menacing in like an almost like disarming way. Because, again, he's not like, you know, scaring them. He's not yelling at them and, and, and being like, why don't you believe this? He does it in such a timid way where he's like, well, now, if you think about Monopoly, As a game, you're like, Monopoly? And just the way he unravels things in such a way that you're kind of like, he he turns into a school teacher. He really turns into a school teacher. And that's not scary, but the way he does it is scary. And so Hugh Grant, you know, we talk about best performances at the end of the year. I feel like Hugh Grant's going to be one of those guys who's going to get a lot of praise for this for this role, and rightfully so, because it's not his typical film. It's not in his wheelhouse, yet he absolutely killed it. And that rolls right into my MVP for um, for Heretic, and that is that is of course Hugh Grant. Um, it, he's a, he's a bad guy who never has to touch you, you know. Uh, the the fact that he he has these women descending deeper and deeper into his house, and he he doesn't approach them; he actually backs away from them. He actually backs up. He he backs up and goes, "You choose the door. I, I'm not doing anything." I. I'm not even telling you you have to stay. You just have to go through one of the doors. I'm not here to keep you here. I just want to see what you do. I have no, I have, I have, I have no dog in the fight. So don't, don't, don't worry about me. Don't worry about little old me with my cardigan. I'm just here to see what you do. That's it. I have a very clear thesis. I have a very, I'm, I'm very dogged in what I believe is going to be the outcome of all this. You just need to do it all for a bad guy to make you do all the things and this is why i brought up saw earlier because really at the end of the day jigsaw makes you do everything now (laughs) and jigsaw makes you mutilate yourself uh uh, mr reed makes you question yourself he makes you question your choices he makes you question the reality that's right in front of you that's superhero villain shit you stole my you stole my idea damon i was going to call him lex luther but you're 100 percent right Lex Luthor is 10 steps ahead of you in chess. 
So you're already behind. You walk through the door, you're already behind the gun. It's too late. You, you're already 10 steps behind. How will you catch up? That is the engine of this movie. You realize when those girls sit down in that house, and they tell you as much in the trailer, when they sit down in this house, they don't know what they're in for. He's already ahead of them. He already knows what he's going to do. He already has everything planned out. And that keeps pulling you through the movie because you're like, shit, like he's not, he doesn't even have to touch them. He's ne he never touches them until there's a couple of moments that later down the line, which you learn that his game of control is he wants to show them a miracle. And the miracle is, is that he actually traps these women, these women down there. He puts them in these weird garbs and he indoctrinates them into believing that, that they need to do this sacrifice themselves for him. But then he tricks the witness into believing it's a resurrection. He'll make a woman drink poison. She'll die. They'll check their pulse. Uh, they'll go, oh my God, she is dead. And he goes, cool. She'll be alive once again. He makes a distraction. He, he distracts your witnesses. And then he replaces them with a live woman. And that woman reads a script. And she, she is resurrected. Hey, there it is. There's the proof, ladies. I found the one true ancient old religion. There it is. And then they're supposed to believe. But these girls didn't believe. So he's like, okay, cool. Uh, let me just reveal the whole fucking trick. And that is, is that control is the thing. I have been controlling this whole process. Every choice you have made, I never had to lay a hand on you. I just put in front of you these choices and you made them, but they were all going to have the same outcome, which is you're going to die. Fantastic villainry, really. And Hugh Grant sells it, you know, from the rafters. Will he get nominated this year, Damon? Don't hold your breath, but it's a hell of a good performance. Yeah, so I mean, reality wise, like this movie doesn't work without Hugh Grant. So I mean, in in reality, this is MVP. Like he is the MVP. Um, because as good as Sophie Thatcher and Chloe East are, and they are great, they need a foil. They need someone to bounce off of. And if you don't have Hugh Grant in this role, this movie just doesn't work. And you could put a lot of other actors in that Hugh Grant, Grant role, and I'm sure some people could pull it off, but I think a lot of people couldn't. And so. Yeah. He really is, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll throw out you know I, I'm going the generic answer with with Wood and Beck uh, with, with, with Woods and Beck because they came up with this idea and the fact that they cultivated it and 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 did it over a decade or more you know coming up with this idea and they them realizing as they started writing it like hey we don't know enough about religion to write this like we can't write for Mister Reed because we don't really know what he knows so we need to come back to this later when we know more when we've studied more when we've read more. And they do. And when you watch this movie, I know, like, I've said this many, many times. This is not a knock on religion. I say this all the time, though. Like, I'm not a religious person at all, but I've read every religious text out there. I've studied religion. I know it. I, I grew up in, in the church. Um, and so, like, when I have a discussion about religion, as uncomfortable as those conversations could be, um... I know what I'm talking about because I've studied it. I'm not just coming from a place of malice or, you know, uh, uh, a mean, I'm not coming at you from a place of anger or just trying to be mean towards you because you don't believe what I believe. I come at you with a point of intelligence. When I have those conversations, uncomfortable conversations, which I have had, I try to come at you with a, with an intelligent approach. So it's not like I'm demeaning you or I'm trying to talk down to you. Um, the way that this film is written does that so well. And the fact that this particular writing pair who also did a quiet place, which is a very smart, intelligent, well-written film, the fact that they did that and they realized early on, like, Hey, we don't know enough about this to do it. Let's come back to it. And then they come back to it and here's what we get. I was like, wow, way to go. Like you really came at this from a smart approach. You really came at this from an intelligent approach. And even in your case where you didn't love it, you can't sit here and say it's not an intelligently written movie. It's a very intelligently written movie. Yeah. And so that's why I say, like, yes, Hugh Grant's the answer because this film doesn't work without him. But just to go in a different direction, I'll say Beck and Woods. And uh, uh, one very important thing about Beck and Woods, they are subversive in this film. Every, every, every trope, everything you believe is the case, they switch it up on you. And the success, the greatest success in any film is to subvert the audience's expectations, to surprise them, to change it up on them. Did I, did I love this movie? Is it going to be in my top five? Probably not. But did it subvert my expectations? Yes, it did. And for that, it gets tons of credit because honestly, some of the movies that are going to end up on my top five don't subvert my expectations necessarily. I just enjoyed them more. 
This one 100% subverts your expectations. That doesn't come around every single movie. The successful movies do that. And this movie's successful. And it's because of the way they did that. And also for the burgeoning writers out there, take note. This is Beck and Woods, very established guys in the business. They were smart enough to realize they didn't have the chops yet to write this. So you might have that script that has a really complex idea in it. And you're like, man, I just can't crack it. Set it off to the side. Write something simpler now. Get good at writing simple and effectively. And and keep moving forward, moving forward, doing turning over a bunch of scripts. And then one day you're going to come back to that script that's in the drawer and say, now I know how to break that thing. Now I know how to crack it. The only way to do that is through experience. But Beck and Woods are showing you the way right now. It's okay. Keep the idea written down. Keep it in the drawer. Write other things that you know you can achieve now and do that. So I think that's a good lesson to take away. And I didn't plan on making this comparison tonight, but it just kind of came up. So I'll bring it up again when I pay compliments to these guys. Um, I brought up earlier, like the social network is about the creation of Facebook and HTML coding and everything. And you could watch that movie and you don't need to know a damn thing about HTML coding to know what that movie's about and how they're creating it, what they're doing to make Facebook. Um, it's just a really well-written movie. Aaron Sorkin is one of my favorite writers and directors. Uh, a Few Good Men is one of my all-time favorite films. Um, I love The Newsroom, the TV show I did on HBO. Aaron Sorkin is a master of dialogue. Now, Patrick, you know me. I'm the dialogue guy. There's a reason why I like Tarantino so much. Aaron Sorkin's another one. And I think that's where I would compare this to is because this is like a very Aaron Sorkin-esque script. And not everyone's going to love Aaron Sorkin. I know Aaron Sorkin yeah. has plenty of detractors who are like, I can't sit through another fucking monologue from one of his characters. This is a monologue-heavy film. So I like as I'm sitting here saying that I loved it, I also understand there are people who are like, I hated The Social Network. Yeah. I hated A Few Good Men. I hated The Newsroom. It just talked to me the whole time. And that's okay, by the way. That's okay that you don't like those movies and that TV show. I am completely okay with that. But that's my kind of thing. And you know that about me, Patrick. I love smart, cutting dialogue. And I think that's probably one of the best compliments I could pay these guys is this is like a horror version of an Aaron Sorkin film. And I love Aaron Sorkin. So, yeah. I love Aaron Sorkin, by the way. I know that might come as a shock to you, but uh, if I was going to pick Tarantino or Sorkin, like I pick Sorkin pretty, like nine times out of 10. I actually really like his stuff. Uh, that, is, that is a good comparison. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, would you like to explain our next category? Because this was an interesting <clears throat> one. And once again, a brainchild of the great Patrick Guerra. Well, you know, this is a bit of a different movie. It does have some scares and some gore in it and plenty of dread, but it's not really that kind of scary movie. So I was like, well, the, the, the traditional categories aren't going to work here. So I came up with weirdest villain kink. And what I mean by that is that sometimes you, you bump into a movie where the villain's actual designs are very different, okay? This isn't Freddy who needs to populate your dreams to create fear to make himself real. This isn't Jason who is going after blindly people that are anywhere in the path of his machete. This isn't even Michael Myers, which we can't agree on what he's after, Where, he, but, but his job is to just hack and slash a bunch of people. No, 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 no. We're talking about the villains that have weird weird i call it a kink but basically the thing that drives them in the movie so damon i will present to you first since it is my category i will ask you what indeed is your weirdest villain kink out there what movie inspires an answer to, for that okay so i went a little off kilter with this one because i had a couple of ideas but i was like the one that always comes back to me is like okay you said weird i'm gonna say dumb but the <laughs> dumb dumbest, is fine dumb is fine by the way <laughs> and you can't explain this one you can't explain this one to me jaws the revenge <laughs> <laughs> the greatest jaws but, movie aside from the original yes go on the shark's kink is he has vengeance against the brody family a fucking white great white shark has vengeance against the Brody family. So not only does he seek vengeance against the youngest Brody kid and kills him at the beginning of the movie, he follows the fucking family down to the Bermudas in warm water where sharks don't exist, and he travels them down there and starts stalking them down there. A fucking shark stalks a family. 
literally, and he has like some sort of weird psychic connection to Lorraine, uh, to uh, to, uh, to Mrs. Love Brody. That movie, <laughs> where when when the, when the shark kills somebody, she feels it psychically. Um, that to me is like the weirdest, dumbest, <laughs> most insane horror film idea ever whoever came up with that and i didn't i, I didn't pull it up to say who wrote it because i don't want to insult the guy whoever <laughs> came up with the idea that this this shark is psychically connected to mrs brody and it's literally following and stalking their family kudos because that might be the weirdest plot for a horror film ever this shark has a brody kink weirdly it's it, it i fucking love jaws the revenge Name another, aside from Jaws, Jaws is a masterpiece, by the way, like and all jokes aside, obviously you and I both worship that movie as being one of the greatest movies ever made, but Jaws the Revenge, name another Jaws sequel you like, name another Jaws sequel you could really talk in depth about the plot, Jaws the Revenge is the only other Jaws movie that matters, fight me on it, you'll lose. It really, because the idea that a shark, which by the way, Bruce is blown to bits in the first movie. So who even is this shark? One of his offspring, <laughs> one of his psychic offspring? Like what the fuck? Like you think like Friday 13th part seven where Tina has psychic powers and, and resurrects Jason from a lake is crazy. Let's one up you with a shark who's going after a specific family because it killed maybe him from another lifetime. It's the most bizarre damon it is like i shouldn't even bother with my answer because there is no more a bizarre answer than the than the shark and jaws the revenge like it is the it is the weirdest and like it's a psychically connected shark too don't forget about yes, that yes it a... even it even shows the image it shows to his wife the image of brody himself saying smile you son of a bitch and i'm like how does how how is that happening <laughs> It is the weirdest. Like I remember watching that movie as a kid, and I was like, "This is so cool!" The shark. Oh, I loved it when I was a kid. And then I grow up, and I'm like, "A shark is stalking them." <laughs> yeah. Okay, that makes total sense. Yeah, it's not. It's not a territorial shark. It's not just because you 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 went into its feeding grounds or anything. It wasn't being a shark. It was being a psychically vengeful shark. <laughs> that there's no weird there's no weirder villain in all of horror damon this, this, this is an is open it. and shut case i mean wh why but i'm not gonna bother with my answer this this is the answer i win i win today you 100 percent win <laughs> well let's move on there's the, the, nothing can top that you're 100 percent right and i'm pissed that i didn't think of it because i love that movie yeah yeah come on you only want to give your answer you had an answer it's just not it's it's gonna be so anticlimactic <laughs> after that <laughs> uh i'm so glad that i gave such a good answer you can't even give yours I feel yeah proud of fuck my now. answer like it it is jaw it is that fucking shark from jaws that caribbean great white shark with psychic powers is 100 percent the weirdest villain kink and it's over the the, the, the uh, whole discussion's over like imagine cocaine bear but the bear is actually like on a vengeful quest to kill <laughs> it's just damon so cocaine weird. bear like, makes a hundred percent sense like cocaine yeah. bear makes sense like there's a logical there are logical steps there there's no <laughs> there's no logical steps in jaws of revenge it is like no no you don't understand this shark is psychic and and i was like okay yeah but bruce is dead so what what's his tie to bruce what's his tie to the brody family don't ask questions was basically the answer that the producers gave. They were like, don't ask questions. Jaws, the revenge, Michael Caine, Mario Van Peoples, the Caribbean. It's going to sell like hotcakes. And this shark is coming after the Brody family. <laughs> <laughs> and it roars too. That's another thing I loved about that. That shark roars, which I was like, I'm pretty sure sharks don't roar. I could it be wrong. About that, the, it comes out of the water a lot in this movie, it like jumps out of the water several times. Like, wow. That's br just, what a brilliant piece of cinema we should cover that one day yeah jaws the revenge so there you go i win tonight i'm so proud of myself uh open I did and shut case to, i did not expect to give such an answer that patrick would be like fuck <laughs> it's the right i'm mad because it's like it should have been my answer like 100 percent. that's because there's yeah. not there's nothing nothing beats that I feel good. I feel good about myself right now. Uh, Patrick, next category, remake, sequel, or leave it alone. This is pretty self-explanatory. This is where we take whatever movie we are reviewing and we say, should they remake it, sequelize it, or leave it alone? So when it comes to Heretic, remake, sequel, or leave it alone? Damon, this is a 100% leave it alone. I don't, first of all, 
Hugh Grant dies at the end of this movie. You, I mean, you're left, and and you know, if we haven't made it clear, Sister Barnes also dies at the end of this movie. You know, she she at the very last second saves Sister Paxton. We thought she was dead, but she mustered up just enough strength to uh, to stop Hugh Grant before he killed uh, Sister Paxton. So all it's just Sister Paxton that's left. I'm not that interested in like a copycat of Mr. Reed who's coming after Sister Paxton or something like that, or or even just a new Mr. Reed in a different place, or he was part of some cult of 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 the cult of control. You know, like not like all of that would cheapen this thing. It's a great little piece. It is what it is. I've probably just given a few producers some ideas for sequels, so you're welcome. Uh so but but in my opinion, Damon, this is a leave it alone. Would it be different if it was a psychically connected shark going after his sister Paxton? Would Sign me up. Now that I would want. Sister Paxton moves to the Bahamas and, and there is a, a psychically connected shark that was connected to Mr. Reed somehow and he is haunting her in the Caribbean. Sign me up for that. I will watch that. Yeah, yes, Mr. Reed the Revenge, 100%. Yeah, so I'm going to go in a slightly different direction than our normal answer here, and I'm going to say prequel. Because I would like to know a little bit more about Mr. Reed, where he came from, where he, you know, where all these thoughts, because he doesn't, they don't really explain his motivation. He just has this motivation of like, he doesn't believe in religion, and he wants to make these two very pious young Mormons question their faith. We don't really learn a whole lot about why he questions the faith, you know, because Every almost everything he says is a riddle wrapped inside of an enigma. You know, he talks about he has a wife over and over again. He says, My wife's in the back, my wife's in the back. And at one point, they both figure out he doesn't have a wife. She's not in the house anywhere. And he actually says, like, would it make you feel better if I went in that door and said I was talking to my wife? Would you still believe it? Because he's just trying to get them to question things. So I would be curious, like, where did Mr. Reed come from? Like, what what led to this? What what made him question his faith? Was it something that happened in his life? Did somebody do this to him? Um, what events led to him being Mr. Reed, the person we meet in Heretic? So I could see a prequel. I could see them making something interesting out of that. I could, yeah. I, th- I think there's something to that. Um it would have to be some young guy playing Hugh Grant. I think it would have to, you'd have to go that route. But it'd be, it, it could be kind of an interesting story. I think you could get away with something like that. Yeah. So our next category, Patrick, is can we survive this horror film? Again, once again, pretty self-explanatory. We put ourselves, so Brother Gara and Brother Martin, we are showing up at this guy's door as apparently Mormon uh, missionaries. Uh, do we survive this horror film, Patrick? Damon, I'd like to put us instead of as as Mormon missionaries. I think if, if you and I, proper fucking Hesher atheists, show up at his door uh, and 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 decide to come in, and uh, the movie begins and ends right there because we're <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have a completely different argument with him. And then <laughs> when he pulls that shit, where it's like, uh, yeah, the front door doesn't open. So what are you gonna do? And Damon's gonna grab him by the throat and choke slam him. And then he goes, "That's what we're gonna do." So open the fucking door. And then the movie's over. So I think we survived this one pretty easily. And also, you know, listen, just just being straightforward, we don't have faith in our lives, so we wouldn't be a target of his. But just being being in the house with him would be hilarious enough. Where he'd be, we'd be like, "Oh, can we come in? It's raining." And he'd be like, "Actually, no." Actually, mm-hmm. you can stay there and we can talk from here. And like, that's fucking ring. Let me in. I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in, in all reality, like we'd have to reverse the situations. Like he'd have to be the super religious guy trying to convince us, right. to, you know, like but that would have to be movie, the plot. But yeah. Yeah. But in this movie, yeah, no way. Because I like Hugh Grant. I would flick Hugh Grant across the room <laughs> with my finger. Um, so that whole thing, like he intimidates the young girls. Like I said, he doesn't intimidate them really. Like he's not, again, he doesn't like threaten them. It's a very, again, very smart way they do it in this movie. Like they are scared of him, but they're not scared of him because he's like, I'm going to hurt you. You know, like he never does that. But it's just, he's being really, it's really disarming for him to be like, no, just literally go through one of the doors. I don't care. Like, I'm not keeping you here. Something about that is super weird to them. And and it, as, as it should be, it's terrifying to be a a woman, any other situation, regardless of that, Never mind being locked in a house with creepy Hugh Grant in a sweater. 
Yeah, it changes the entire point of the movie. The movie <laughs> would last like 12 minutes because we'd get in the house and he'd be like, he'd be like, well, the door's locked and uh, I have no wife and there's no blueberry bread. I'd be like, you didn't bring pie, motherfucker? No right, pie? You're going, you're going through this window right about now. Um, so yeah, we'd survive because he couldn't do that to us. There ain't going to be no physically overpowering no. us or physically intimidating us. He'd be like, oh, yeah, like you said, he would see us on the front doorstep. He'd look through the people and be like, never mind, you're good. <laughs> Take off, we're good. You don't want to hear about our Lord and Savior Satan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't. You don't. We, we can't come in for some pie, my bugger. No, no. Uh, I smell yeah, pie in there. Open it up. Yeah, it'd be a very short visit. He would be like, uh, "You know what? I'm good. You guys can go on down the road. There's another guy down the road you can talk to." Uh, yeah, that would be, it'd be a very short movie. Uh, Patrick, last category when we talk about heretic, is it scary? So at the end of the day, heretic, is it scary? Damon, it's dreadful. That's what's most important. It is a dreadful movie for sure. Um, at times, is it, was I a little frustrated at times? Cause I'm like, everybody's seeing the red flags here. Why aren't we doing anything? Um, but then they, but again, back in woods, very, very wisely, they cover all their bases. So at the end of the day, you are just, contr you're controlled, right? Beck and Woods have controlled you into a situation that is believable enough. It got You got to these certain steps logically. And when logic is applied to horror, it induces dread because you go, well, wait a minute, we did all the right things and it's still not working. That is this movie in a nutshell. It is 100% that movie in a nutshell. Uh, these women were always going to knock door to door. They were always going to come in for a welcoming, friendly, Hugh Grant looking type of person because he doesn't pose a, a typical threat of any reason. And he says, yeah, my wife's right in here. Come on in. That is a logical reason for them to step through the door. Once they step through the door, they don't realize they're in a trap until they are 100 percent understood that it's, that it's a trap. But the, the sinisterness, the fact that he can he can control them without touching them, without forcing anything on them. That's terrifying. That's dreadful. It makes you go, damn, this, this, because you feel a little outsmarted, truth be told. I think that's another thing. And, and I think you and I fancy ourselves like semi-intelligent guys. And when, when you get into a situation like that, where you're like, I am outsmarted in this, in this instance, that's scary. Yeah, it's an exercise in tension. And, and to their credit, we throw the red flags, like to the girl's credit, when he's clearly being weird and kind of evasive with his questions about his wife and the pie and everything. Like they do question it. Like they try to leave the house. Yeah. Like they try to get out. You know, it doesn't get to the point where he goes to the back room and he's like, go out one of these fucking doors and you know, like you got to go through my basement or whatever. Like they try to leave the house. Like they literally like, we just got to go. So like they're smart enough to realize they're in a bad spot. They should not be in. So like to the character's credit, they're not just there like, Oh, let's hang out and see what else he's got to say. Uh, yeah. You know, they're trying to get out. So, yeah, it's an exercise in tension and uncomfortable tension. And then it does get to those dreadful moments where you're just like, man, what is going to happen? And I think what I loved so much about this film, as I said earlier, while there does end up being a little physical interaction later, particularly with somebody getting their throat slashed and little things like that, somebody getting a nail, a board, a board full of nails to their head. It's not that kind of physically intimidating movie. This isn't the kind of movie where he's holding the girls down and he's torturing them and it becomes that kind of, you know, really disturbing kind of movie. It's not that. And I appreciate that his manipulation of these girls is all psychosomatic. You know, it's not it's not I'm bigger, stronger, so you have to do what I'm saying. Now, is it implied? Cause they don't just run or they don't just like attack him in the movie. Yeah. They understand like he's a, 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 an older male bigger than them. He would overpower them, but they don't use that as like the central theme of this movie. So I think it is very tension filled. It is very dreadful and it is a very sinister kind of thought provoking, scary movie in that way. Now, is it going to be the kind of movie that's going to make you jump out of your seat and scream? You're going to go running from the theater because you got jump scared out of your mind. no, but it is the kind of movie where you're gonna be like, this is really uncomfortable, and I'm I'm a I'm a big believer in that, like the, uh, the uncomfortable levels of tension, and this movie pulls that off in spades. It really does. It kind of reminds me of that Tim Roth movie, um, Resurrection, the one with Tim Roth and um, oh God, what's her name? Uh, but but basically, Tim Roth manipulates manipulates uh Rebecca Hall, excuse me, yeah. into doing doing everything without him ever touching her. It's all a mental game. And that makes you feel helpless because you're like, well, yes, I can choke slam Hugh Grant through a table, but 
if he's got me mentally tricked, I'm kind of stuck. And so that's that's what this movie's all about. It's a fun way to engage the audience. It's a different way than a lot of the horror movies you're going to see this year. So it's definitely worth checking out. And you know, Damon and I are going to tell you over and over again, you got to go see it in the theater. That's the way to watch this movie. Experiencing it any other way, you might miss some of the greatness of it. It reminds, you mentioned Tim Roth, it reminds me of the opening scene, as weird as this sounds, the opening scene of Pulp Fiction, where he's talking yeah. to, where Pumpkin and Honey Bunny are talking, and he's talking about robbing liquor stores. And he's like, you're going to get your head blown off. He's like, I read a story about a guy who went into a bank with a telephone. He handed the telephone to the teller, and he said, we've got this little guy, we got this guy's little girl, give him all the money, or we're going to kill the little girl. And they give him all the money. And she's like, did they return the little girl? He's like, I don't know if there was a little girl. He robbed it with a fucking telephone, because that's the mental manipulation in that moment the teller in the bank's like he's his girl his little girl's been kidnapped if i don't give up this money they're gonna kill his little girl and that's like in that moment you're like oh shit i gotta do this was there ever a little girl was there ever a kidnapping who knows maybe not probably not but that's that's the level of like an intelligent person they're like i'm not gonna go in guns blazing where i can get shot they're gonna go in with like the hey we've got this guy's daughter kidnapped and if you don't give him all the money we're gonna kill her you know, like, it's kind of like, that's what this movie is. This movie's not putting a gun in your face. This movie's no. telling you, like, you know, hey, here's the, here's the situation. Believe it or not, is your face strong enough to believe where you're at and get you out of here? If not, then you better start questioning things because that's the only way you're going to get out of here. And and that, to me, is a very intelligent, well-written movie. And, again, full of tension, full of dread. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. But I also understand, I can say this openly and honestly in the podcast, Patrick, it's not going to be for everybody. And and yeah. this isn't like, you know, like I know Terrifier 3 is a much different example, but when people say, I just don't go for that kind of like gore and hardcore extreme, you know, horror, I get it. I get it. It's not for everybody. And I kind of say the same thing about Heretic. Like, I loved it. I adored this movie. But I also understand it's not going to be for everybody. This is not like, I think one of the more universally beloved films this year, which you didn't love, but but Late Night with the Devil seems to be like a film that, generally speaking, the vast majority of the audience has liked it. This isn't that. And yeah, I can honestly not. say that. Like, this, it's going to be a 50-50 movie. Like, I loved it. There's going to be people who be like, I fucking hated this movie. I get it. But for me personally, it was an exercise in extreme tension and dread. And I love that. Yeah, you better take swings this year because this year is chock full of movies and I do believe Heretic takes a swing. Absolutely. All right, Patrick, that is our episode this week. We'll be back next week for another edition of the show. Of course, if you got questions, comments, movies you'd like us to review, we always love hearing from you guys. I would love to hear your opinions on this movie in all seriousness. Like whether you're religious, you're not religious, I want to hear what you thought coming out of this movie. So if you've seen Heretic, you want to send us a line, send us a message on social media. We're on Twitter slash X. We're on Facebook and we're on Instagram. Just search Rewind of the Living Dead. We tend to get a lot of our messages on Instagram, so feel free to reach out to us there. But you can also send us an email, rotlivingdead at gmail.com. That's rot. Living dead at gmail.com. And also, I'm dead serious when I say this. I would love to hear from you guys on your opinions of this movie. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Were you bored? Were you blown away by how intelligent it was? I'm curious because I feel like this is going to be one of the more polarizing horror films this year. Um, obviously, so send us that email. Send us those questions. Obviously, we always appreciate you guys checking us out on all your favorite podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and, of course, over on our website, rewindofthelivingdead.com, where you can also get the latest and greatest in horror news. Uh, and you can also find us on our YouTube channel. Just search Rewind of the Living Dead. I know I say it all the time, and I'm sorry for people who are tuning out right now, like, shut up, dude, and we're tired of it. But if you don't watch us on YouTube, totally fine. I wouldn't necessarily want to look at my face for an hour and a half either. But... <laughs> You can subscribe, and it really does mean a lot for us in terms of the algorithm, search results, things like that. So if you could, please, a small favor for us. If you have a YouTube page or you just have a login, subscribe to our page. And rate our podcast wherever you listen to it. You're on Spotify, you're on Apple, wherever you listen to your podcast, rate us there too. That's the same kind of help that it gives us. It gives us visibility. Subscribe to our podcast. If you if you listen on a weekly basis, you might as well subscribe. But yeah, subscribe do all that stuff because it really does help our visibility. Absolutely. We really appreciate that. And obviously you can also reach out to us on our own personal social media channels. I will always respond when I can. And I love to hear from you guys. I am at Damon Martin and you are at director Patrick. 
And a big thank you, as always, for everyone that tunes into the show. We'll be back next week with another edition of Rewind of the Living Dead. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you then. Peace.